And Jesse, my apologies. I saw your name was Zoom admin, and I did not realize it was Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that I should have changed it earlier. Yeah, has, has to be changed every time. <laughs> Good to see you. And it's also good to see Maggie, Amanda, and Jenny. Thank you for coming today. I know it's Saturday, and I know in Madison, at least, it is a gorgeous day to be outside, and you definitely need to take advantage of those days when you have them in Wisconsin. So thank you for being here today. If um, these aren't your Zoom names, feel free to change them to the name you'd like us to call you by, if that, um, if that needs to be. So again, apologies for a little bit of late start, a little bit of hiccups, but I think we're good to go now. So. Um, Chatted us. I have the um, uh, chat box open that I'll be monitoring. We'll be muting people as they arrive so that as the presentation goes on, you know, we don't hear all the um, steps time. We are recording the meeting for later recording and start thinking of uh, questions for the team. So I just gave you some of the logistics and in our time today, we will be going through the Girl Scout Promise and Law. Then we're gonna see, for, uh, listen to um, Team Badger Shield and then we will have a quick five minutes to go over Q&A if there's any questions um, that you might have for them. So we can start with the Girl Scout Promise and Law. Jesse and Brian, feel free to um, join us if you would like. Otherwise, feel free to um, you know, be a supporter as uh, we do uh, our promise and our law. So uh, here we go. Calling my order, I will try to serve my community and my country to help people at all times and to live by the Girl Scout law. I will do my best to be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong and responsible for what I say and do and to respect myself and others, respect authority, use resources wisely, make the world a better place and be a sister to every Girl Scout. Thank you everyone. And welcome Babette and Loretta. Welcome as well. Okay, so I just wanted to throw up this big, um, um, infograph about all the partners that are listed on the UW Makerspace for the Badger Shield. These are all the partners that all work together and we are super excited to listen to um, people who were there at the at the very start. When the call was put out, um, they were the ones that picked up the phone and then called each other <laughs> to figure out what they were going to do to help. So really quick, if we want to, you can either enter it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Who here knows what collaboration means? And feel free to like raise your hand, we'll unmute you, or feel free to drop it in the chat, either one. What is, what do you think collaboration is? And if we don't have someone who's a Girl Scout, we are going to call on Brian or Jesse to give us their definition of collaboration. All right. Working together and sharing ideas. Working together, very good. Nice, thank you. Um, and who here knows what innovation means? Innovation, let's think about that word. What does innovation mean? And again, chat or raise your hand and we can call on you. What does innovation mean? There is a social innovation badge and we do work on our entrepreneurial badges and projects too, so we should think about that. Anyone? Let's see. Okay, well, how about Brian? What, how would you define innovation? Well, I think I would define it as a kind of creation or a simple way of thinking about something that might be ordinary to you, but looking at it in a different way and trying to approach it in a different way to find a kind of novel solution. It might be a way that nobody's thought about that problem before and create a, create a new solution. Nice. And here in Wisconsin, um, one of the models, one of our big words is forward. So always thinking forward, always thinking of how we can push it, that idea or whatever that process is or structure, or whatever, just a little bit further, right? So in response, I'll do the introduction now, in response to an urgent request from the anesthesiology department at UW Health to respond to a shortage of personal protective equipment or PPE, especially face shields, a partnership between UW Makerspace, Delve, and Midwest Prototyping was formed. We quickly created an open source face shield design, the Badger Shield, that could be made from parts anyone could acquire and with methods anyone could use. 
a system was created to match hospitals in need around the world with manufacturers who stepped up to make shields. Over the last few months, the Badger Shield has been replicated in many small variations based on that original drawing over 20 million times. And if you go on their website, they have even taken that idea forward. So there's even further iteration from what you may see today. We are really happy to welcome um, people from the team who are at that ground level, like I said. So from Delve, unfortunately, I don't see Corinne right now, but she may be joining us later. She is in California, so <laughs> it is a little bit different. Um, and also tech, right? Tech is like, that's just what it is. So Corinne Cross, the Director of Visual Communications at Delve, Jesse Darley, Director of Mechanical Engineering and Principal at Delve, and Brian Ellison, Business Development Manager, Manager at Midwest Prototyping. So we're excited to hear your story. I'm gonna make um, Jesse a host. And then I am going to pop off. Whoopsie daisy, sorry. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Jesse. Hi, is the, is the uh, screen showing? The PowerPoint showing for everyone? Okay, so thanks. Thanks everyone, I, we're really excited to be here tonight to tell you a little bit about our story and try to connect it to um, to the Girl Scouts and what you are learning to be to be amazing citizens. So, uh, Katrine gave a great introduction of the main players. Um, like she said, uh, Lennon Rogers, who's not here tonight, who runs the makerspace at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, was was uh, was given a call by the university hospital and his wife who works as an anesthesiologist and then he quickly called Brian to say can you help us make face shields potentially 3d printing them as Midwest prototyping does a lot of is, is additive manufacturing or 3d printing and then called me to help with design um, and it was an exciting time. And when we were make, gave, given that call, we tried to think about how we we're gonna attack that problem. And I'm gonna step back for just a second to talk about a process that um, all three organizations use, which is really figuring out ways to design cool stuff using a process called design thinking, which takes a, a number of steps. The first is really um, empathizing, which means understanding um, the problem and the and the people involved in the problem. What is what is their environment? What are the tools that they have? How are they going about their lives? How can we solve their problem in their environment? So that after after you understand the problem, you really try to write a problem statement and figure out how how you think the best way to solve it is. And with that problem statement, then you can start ideating or brainstorming, coming up with ideas. And sketching them on a paper and sketching as many ideas as you can and then you get together and you say what what do we think some of the best ideas are um, and then you start building them you prototype them and you and you, then you test them and whatever you got wrong you you change and you prototype again and you test again until you get it right um, so that is the process that we took which which potentially took us in a slightly different direction than many people out in the world where they were attacking the problem kind of from a technology perspective. What do I have to make, to make a face shield in this case? And a lot of people said, oh look, I have this 3D printer sitting next to me. What if I 3D printed a frame um, and then I could put a piece, of, um, a piece of plastic on the front of it and I have a face shield and I would make a really great face shield. The problem is that 3D print takes takes about an hour to make that frame and we're talking about needing to deliver a hundred million face shields to, to protect all the doctors and nurses so a hundred million hours uh, we still wouldn't be done making those if we started in March uh, we would still be printing those map those face shields so again we want to we really want to connect this to your um, to your life and how and what you're doing with the Girl Scouts. So there's three ways we're going to talk about this. The way Badger Shield really promoted positive values 
we wanted to use our ethics um, and act responsibly and really, really think about the people that were at risk, which in this case were the anesthesiologists, nurses, and the patients that they were serving. Brian and I are basically can't stop ourselves from seeking challenges. We, we go out and we say, you know, let's see, is this, is this the right risk? If we fail, we'll just, we'll just stop. I, I heard a quote recently that um, the key to success is quitting early. So you can either fail or you can quit and you can learn from those mistakes. But if you, you got to get up and you got to try as many times as you can, because sometimes you're going to succeed. And then looking at community problem solving, this is obviously a really direct problem in our community. So we're looking how to identify those problems in the community and figure out ways to solve them, to create those action plans. So we, we've talked about this. What our problem was how to protect the helpers. Um, I'm not going to go, that's re repetitive, the first one, but we really wanted to understand how they used their PPE first so that we wouldn't alter their behavior. And we got, so the first day we heard about this problem, Brian had a friend who worked at the UW hospital, asked her to grab a face shield from the hospital and drop it off uh, at my at my front porch. This is still when we really didn't know what, what was safe distancing. So she left it and then texted me and left my house. So I never even saw her. I just opened up a paper bag, pulled it out and realized how simple, uh, simple the, the product was. It was a piece of foam, a piece of elastic and a piece of plastic and a couple staples. That's all it was. And so all of the complicated designs that were time consuming to make um, and potentially costly um, would have gotten in our way, even even though they may have may have been a little bit more clever. So that's the empathy part um, of that design thinking process. So we quickly came up with the design and started prototyping it. Went through a couple of quick iterations on size of the face shield, size of the foam methods for uh, stapling, whether we were folding elastic over or not. And then we developed a drawing that told our, that, that showed our process step by step. So you can see basically three steps of prepping your components, assembling it, and then bagging it, and then shipping it out. And this drawing was made within, Brian, what was it? Maybe three days of, of the problem being presented to us? Yeah. Super quick. Yeah, and this is this is all of the stuff that's happening and hap that happened at Midwest Prototyping early in that time. Brian trying to figure out how to laser cut um, each of each of the face shields and having to put pieces of um, steel down in the middle of each of them so they wouldn't curl up and uh, and move after they were cut. Um, it took a long time. <laughs> Yeah, we found a better method. Yeah, and that's a good point. So this is this is we did we we quickly made kind of two ways to make these face shields. The way that we could expect someone in their um, in their home to make it if they had access to a, a pair of scissors or a laser cutter, and then a big a big factory that could order plastic from a place that could cut them out with a with a um, a steel die and make them uh, one a second or even faster. But the but what we what we really wanted to do was get this design out into the world. So we made we changed the design that we got from the hospital to to use materials that we could find on a website we use all the time called McMaster Car that you could just go and buy it yourself. And then we took McMaster, McMaster cars is like the Amazon for nerds. <laughs> <laughs> right. And when he means nerds, he means me. <laughs> Specifically. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and then we took that drawing and we made a PDF, which is a, a kind of file that anybody can read. And we put it on our website. And then we 
um, and then we blogged about it, put it on different social media sites, and people quickly found it and started learning from it and trying trying to do it themselves, including companies like Ford and Toyota. And at the same time, Midwest Prototyping started making as many face shields as they could for UW Hospital. And there's Brian uh, in the, you know, early in the morning, in the middle of the night, going down to the dock with, with face shield boxes and, and sending them out uh, into the hospital to be, to be used by the anesthesiologists and nurses. So be, besides, um, you know, if, if our main problem was trying to protect the healthcare workers, um, as many of you know, one of the big things that happened when COVID hit was that businesses shut down and people and those companies were not selling, uh, making or selling anything anymore. Um, so one of the things with that open source um, drawing was that, that it, went out into the world really fast and companies that didn't know what to do because they were having to send all their workers home and their workers were potentially not going to be paid anymore. They're going to go, they were going to be unemployed. They said, wow, I think we could do this. And um, this happened probably, Brian, I, do you even know the number? Is it a thousand companies in that order, maybe making face shields? Yeah, I don't know the exact number of companies, but you know, it was, it ended up being like, you know, 20 to 25 million face shields that ended up getting made worldwide. And we, as Midwest Prototyping, we only made about a half a million shields. But, you know, again, it shows that, you know, when you start that spark and, you know, create something um, that you share and that you collaborate with others, that you can do something that's so much bigger than, than yourself. So one of the, one of the stories that just, um, you know, I can't, I can't stop telling is Coaster Pedicab or Coaster Cycles. This is a company that made uh, delivery bikes um, and pedicabs uh, in Montana. And they had to shut their factory down. This, this guy in the bottom right corner, Justin, is a buddy of mine. We, we helped them design their pedicab years ago. He called me up and said, hey, can you help me figure out how to make these face shields? And we I gave him some tips, and then his his team um, figured it out how to ramp up, and they ended up making millions of face shields for um, for hospital systems on the West Coast, mostly the state of Washington. I also worked with a woman in um, England um, that ramped up a program to make Badger shields for the National Health Service. So they have a socialized medicine in England. So all of the hospitals are part of the government. And, and they were able to um, deliver all of those face shields all over the UK. And then in the middle of this picture down here is a woman in Malaysia who sent me a note saying that they also were able to save their factory and, and keep their people working um, uh, because they found a design and a product that people needed. So as, as Badger Shield took off, as the press um, kind of talked about it, and, and as more and more companies started making face shields, um, the hospital came to us and said, here are 10, um, uh, sorry, I, I'm jumping ahead. So the, uh, at this point, um, we we ran into really we ran into a few snags. We it felt like we were making huge progress at the beginning, um, but then success brought challenges. In a, for example, Ford bought every piece of elastic that was in in the in the U.S. Brian couldn't find a single inch of elastic and had to figure out how to make how to make um, uh, a pivot, as we call it. And they talked to a company up in northern Wisconsin um, that delivered diaper elastic to them. Uh, and we got our own supply of diaper elastic to be able to add to, uh, to replace that elastic. So, I'm going to show you guys one of the initial 
ones that they sent us had this sort of really frilly purple on it. And um, so we made all these shields. It was sort of, we're in this emergency situation. We just started making thousands of these. And what was funny is that we had um, half of the people that responded back to us said, you know, we work in an emergency room or we work in the hospital and, you know, can you get us something other than the frilly purple uh, bands? And then we'd also get the same number that were like, we work at the children's hospital or we work in the, you know, we're, we're pediatric doctors and we love those purple bands. Where can we get more of those? So uh, it was funny, either you loved them or you, or you hated them. Uh, so, like I was saying, the, the, the UW hospital then came to us with their list of 10 other things they needed help with. So, once you prove yourself, prove that you can solve problems, people, people will ask you to solve more problems. It's almost like a, vir it's a virtuous circle. Um, it can also be overwhelming, but in this case, it was pretty, pretty amazing. And their, um, their number one, um, the number one product that they asked us to help them make was a positive air pressure respirator, which is like one of these hazmat hoods that's attached to a hose, and there's a blower that you wear around your waist. Um, it's much more difficult um, problem than than a face shield, but once we started working on it, um, I think I said to Brian and Corinne, "This this is the reason we were brought onto." The project. This is what we need to work on um, because it's such a it's such an amazing uh, protective piece of equipment, and it takes and it takes a lot of work, and it really was this challenge that we wanted to uh, rise up to. Um, but it was but like I said, there were a lot of things we had to figure out. Um, the first was fit. Uh, so we again we took the papper hoods that the hospital was using and Corinne ripped them apart and made a pattern um, and made Corinne's, Corinne's on now right yeah Corinne's on um, she, <laughs> she is both the um, miracle worker in terms of graphic design making this presentation look great and the um, soft goods designer um, that figured out how to make all of the fabric components and connect them to um, connect them to the lens the plastic piece and turn it into turn it into an easily manufacturable hood so we went through seven versions of the hood she would drop them off on her front porch there down here in the middle with the blue picture that's me and I would try them on see how it worked then take them down to the hospital. And this is Dr. Springman here in the red. He would try them on, tell, tell us what, what didn't work and we would make some changes. And then we were also working with production uh, sewing companies to refine the design to, to use the, as little material as possible and to be able to sew it as quickly as possible. We also had to figure out how to connect it to those hoses so we, went through a number of designs uh, and 3D printed these connectors uh, that fit onto the back of the, of the hood. And, and the real issue there was that all the different hospitals bought different blowers. Those are the things you wear around your waist. And so every hose had, a, had its own connector. So we had to get the hose, measure it, figure out how to connect to it, make a new design, 3D print it, and try it out. Um, and we're still doing that. Five months later, people say, I want to connect it to this blower. Can you make me ad an adapter? So we're calling, we call it the universal papper. And, and like Katrina was saying, Brian and um, the UW Makerspace is continuing to figure out ways to, to keep people safe and to come up with new designs. Corinne and I are less, con less involved at the moment, um, but, but we continue to just uh, hear amazing stories from around the world. And this is, this is one of the moments, this is one of the times that's, you know, I'll remember for the rest of my life. Obviously, COVID, everyone's gonna remember, but the, 
um, going from being sent home to getting this challenge and spending every day for the next few months working on it was, was really a, a memorable moment, I think, in all of our lives. Yeah, and I don't usually sew um, for work, but I uh, learned from my grandmothers and my mom and practiced a lot and um, did it in my spare time. And um, having that skill nowadays with masks and um, especially with this, with my um, being able to make patterns and understand and read patterns and have other people make the same thing with your pattern um, is a great skill to practice that, um, you don't necessarily need to go to school for it. it just takes a lot of practice or maybe some YouTubes um, and uh, um, it can help in a lot a lot of ways so I um, am grateful for that so Brian Brian has given kits um, of face shield kits which means a, a lens the plastic part um, the elastic and the foam that has a has adhesive on one side that's covered in a piece of paper and 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 then did you provide staplers as well or is that the stapler is provided by your by the kids i'm sure you got staplers typically yep so all you have to do is get a kit and a stapler and follow the little follow the little drawing and you can make your own face shields for if you have family members that are going to jobs where they may be um, maybe facing um, people that they could have COVID, either healthcare workers, restaurant workers, you're, um, or you could be providing them to those, those folks. They are, they are fun to make and fun to, and fun to give away. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, Katrine, at all. Yeah, and I'm, um, I have, um, after the q and I will pop up a, uh, yeah, a slide about it. And there's some really fun things that I'll talk about later, too, that we've been hearing of the Girl Scouts who have already picked up some face shields, just to spur some ideas as well. So that's all we have. We really, um, we would love to hear your questions. I know that this is a really high level, um, high level thing, but I would say maybe the only thing I want to emphasize is the number of friendships that I think I made over the course of this project is pretty, pretty incredible. So I, you know, you don't necessarily think about that while you're doing, doing something, but it really does create, create bonds when people band together to solve a problem. For sure. Well, and the thing, I think actually I was thinking um, through the presentation to point out, I think is what's really cool is I don't know if it I don't know if everybody understands when we use the term open source um, because you know there's you think about it and it's like you do something at school and somebody else sees it and you're like oh well this is how I did it and then somebody else can do it um, a lot of times in business businesses look at creating ideas and not sharing them because then they can keep the idea for themselves and then they can make it and nobody else can. And so then there's this ability to sell to everybody because they want it and, and you can make more money and you can, you know, you have more opportunity. And, you know, to be honest, when you look at our regular business, it's that we provide a service that other people can't. And so we don't necessarily want to always share what we do. But in situations like this, when you look at what is the goal, what are we trying to accomplish through this process? Is it that we want to sell? 25 million face shields or is it that we want people to be safe wherever they are and it makes a very different situation and so um you know one of the things that we talked about obviously was collaboration but i think the other thing that's really important as a part of collaboration is trust and it's trusting the people that you work with and it's trusting that when you put something out into the universe that um it's so that other people can share in that as well and uh, it was funny because I had somebody ask me, uh, you know, I said, oh, well, we put, uh, we shared uh, through open source, we shared this design with people and people are using it all over the world. And somebody said, well, you're going to make yourself go out of business because other people are going to make it. And I said, 
you know, the ultimate hope is that we all are out of business from making face shields because that means that we don't need any more face shields and that, that uh, we're taking care of all of our healthcare workers and we're taking care of all the people that need face shields and we can go back and do our regular business. So, you know, in, in this situation, it's not necessarily wanting to keep something from others, but trying to share as, as many as possible. And that really became difficult, as Jesse said, you know, I had, I had the buyers from Ford calling me and asking me who I was ordering foam from and who I was ordering elastic from. And I knew that if I gave them those names and numbers, that they were going to order so much that I couldn't get elastic and foam anymore. But what I recognize is that Ford could make so many more and do so much more good than what I could, than what, what we could do as a group just because of their size, that I had to give them that information. And so that's where it become a greater good. And that's where it becomes you know, recognizing you're part of a, you're part of a larger community that, that needs you to help in that way. So. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. I am going to um, just share my screen really quick, just so I have everyone up there so you can see them. Um, but again, yes, thank you for uh, sharing exactly like how it happened. And it kind of boggles the mind when you think of how fast it actually went when you were describing the timeline from the ask to the actual design to the creation. I mean, it. you think of manufacturing mostly because I sat in a couple of automotive design, engineering, and manufacturing workshops of, of, you know, that timeline of 17 to 18 months, and a car is great, and a car can be a necessity, but a car can also be a luxury, and it's just fascinating to think when there's a need, how fast you all went, so thank you for, like, that super fast turnaround and helping the community. If we have any questions, um, let me see. Uh, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself. There's not a lot of us here, so you can um, go ahead and unmute um, or raise your hand. I've been seeing people. I'm a little new to Zoom, so all you people who have been doing Zoom for a while are able to do those hand emojis, so I can see those on the screen. Otherwise, feel free to drop them in the chat. Yes, and it's good to see you, Corinne. Thank you. Um, I understand it was California, so, you know, we're all in different time zones. Collaboration is worldwide. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little late. I, I got my time zone mixed up. <laughs> Do you have any questions? I, I'm totally happy also to kind of pop us off. Um, let me see here. Oops, sorry about that. So, what stumbling blocks if any, and I'm going to assume you did, because you must have had some prototypes as you went around different iterations. Did you find along the way, and how did you go about solving them? Yeah, I think the um, the paper was really, you know, the the funny part. I think we talked about the um, ramp up and the scale problems with the the Badger Shield. I think that's been talked about a lot. The paper really from a design perspective, had had a lot of stumbling blocks. One, one of the um, supply problems was fabric. Um, so when you, um, when you start looking at the, all of the impacts of COVID, one of them was that nothing was being brought into the United States for a few, uh, for a month or so. And fabric was one of those things. And there, we quickly learned that there are very few places in the United States that make fabric anymore. Um, it's made, it's made in Taiwan and Bangladesh and China and Vietnam. Um, so we saw all of these places in North Carolina, um, ramping up, uh, especially to provide fabric. And when you look at something like a pepper, there are a lot of requirements for that fabric. It's not just whatever you can find at Joann's. It has to be, it has to uh, not let um, microbes in, you know, virus and bacteria. It needs to be water resistant. It also uh, needs to, and kind of and airtight. Um, and we did a, an amazing search to find fabric and then to find someone that would be able to sew these. And all many of those places are also not in the U.S. They make samples for 
or manufacturers that, um, uh, you know, like Patagonia and places like that. But, but the one place we were able to find was right in New York City in the garment district. Um, and Brian is still working with um, uh, New York, what is it, New York Embroidery? New York Embroidery Studio, yeah, they do a lot of the runway fashion work for Mark Jacobs and Tom Brown and a lot of the sort of high-end fashion. So they're doing these runway projects that are hundreds of thousands of dollars alongside making, you know, making our little hoods. Um, and uh, the thing I remember the most in sort of starting out um, was, I think, Corinne, wasn't your first prototype out of like a blue plastic tablecloth? <laughs> yeah, um, so thinking of stumbling blocks, just um, getting enough fabric to make a larger hood uh, during a pandemic was tough. We, I went over to the office and found a blue medical tablecloth that we've used for some of our other medical studies there. And, um, but it was enough fabric to make the pattern that you saw I was holding up. It was a little bit larger than just, you know, napkins or other bits of fabric that don't have seams and things in them like your clothing and pants and things like that. So, um, and to, uh, it had to have certain properties, like um, when the air goes in through the tube in the back, it inflates um, the hood and passes it, the air over um, in front of the shield and then down through the neck. So um, nothing's coming in. Uh, so it had to function well. You couldn't have um, like a, a, a fabric that the air just blew through and um, would sag on your face. <laughs> so. Um, we learned lots of, uh, or we had stumbling blocks, but mostly learnings. Um, that's the process of prototyping. So our first one was that tablecloth. Um, and uh, every time I'd make one, Jesse would put it on, we'd take it to the um, hospital and learn what needs to be better. So um, how it's attached, how you put it on without go putting your hands inside so it's not a, um, so you don't get anything in there. Um, how the elastic fits around the head, um, how the tube goes into the, the fabric, how do you secure it, um, how does the, uh, the size, the amount of fabric in the pattern need to change. So that's why it took seven times just to get to something that we could, um, that we thought was working enough. Uh, because it was more, it didn't have to be perfect. Uh, lots of companies out there have perfected these hoods and make them every day, but they just couldn't make enough. So this was, the idea behind ours was to try to make it simple enough that um, any manufacturer who is familiar with sewing fabric um, in New York or wherever we could find one could, could pump them out. Um, and also use the simpler format of the Badger Shield itself. So um, that was the challenge and um, uh, that's what we did over, I think it was just like two or three days. So maybe four days. And uh, so it was a lot of sewing and a lot of trying and a lot of Jesse riding his bike back and forth from his house to my house to the hospital <laughs> in, Mount, in March. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was a great, it was a, um, fast process, but uh, we made a lot of headway in a short amount of time. And I'm actually shipping 500 of those hoods to California. This is so exciting. Yeah. Good job. Awesome. Do we have any other questions? Because I have one more because I'm looking at our time. I want to make sure I'm mindful for everybody on the call. Any others in the chat? Okay, my big one is, so as you know, there is a um, social innovation badge that Girl Scouts can work through, and that's all about um, identifying, you know, problems or existing um, issues or products or things, you know, that currently are in our world and improving upon it or finding that gap um, that needs to be addressed. And so uh, from each of you, we'd love to know what advice do you have for Girl Scouts who want to be social, social innovators uh, one of our big uh, missions is to help girls, you know, develop character, confidence, courage, and we're finding compassion to be a really big one too. And compassion is really driving innovation. So what advice do you have for girls that want to be social innovators and impact and help their communities? Hmm, good question. 
I have a couple of thoughts. I guess the first thing is, um, you know, this is, a, this is about purpose. If you're talking about social innovation, it's about purpose. So I would say find something that you feel that uh, would have an impact that you care about. So first of all, start with something that you care about. And then the second would be find, find someone that, that you trust or that you're impressed by or that you're friendly with and just get together and have a partner to start with and bounce ideas off them. Talk, talk about what you think you might want to do. Um, and that, that helps you. And then third, this is, this is the lesson of Badger Shield. You have to have, we call it a customer, but let's just say someone that you're, that you are designing for, you are innovating for. So don't just do it in a vacuum and think that you're going to solve the right problem. You need to understand the problem well. And the best way to do that is to have someone that is going to be impacted by your solution. I would add, um, think of the things that you really um, think you're, you're, you have a skill at. Um, could be drawing, could be talking to people, could be asking questions and learning, could be doing research to find out what the problems are, or who's, who's done similar things, could be sewing, could be um, anything like that. Whatever your skill set is, um, try to pick those things and find your partner who has other skills um, so that you can work together and add to each other's um, ideas and uh, push the idea forward because it, it takes, um, takes teamwork. Yeah, I think the last thing that I would say to add to those is that sometimes you hear the expression that when you're a hammer, everything is a nail, meaning that you already have in your mind as to what you want to do. And so you, you find an answer based on what you want the answer to be. And I think that um, real innovation comes from maintaining an open mind and recognizing that maybe what you were trying to solve initially doesn't need to be solved. Maybe there's something different um, that's actually the problem. And that um, being flexible enough to change, being flexible enough to listen to other people, um, and in all honesty, even getting to the point where you might be 75% done with your innovation or even almost 100% done with your innovation and saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to set it aside and, and do something totally different this week. Uh, or I'm going to, I'm going to tell myself why this is a bad idea and try to find something different. Just, just the idea that always be challenging yourself to make sure that you're, you're constantly recognizing what, you know, what you started with and where you're ending with and how that changed. So, so love the process, make, make mistakes, um, you know, have things that you look back on and laugh at. I mean, I, I still laugh at, you know, purple really diaper elastic um, and foggy lenses that we were cutting with lasers and things like that, where there's, and, uh, and you know, and, and just recognizing that there's what fun that comes from the process if you allow yourself to engage in that. So just be, uh, challenge yourself as a part of the process. Don't always expect other people to do that. Thank you. I think um, one of the first slides that you showed was uh, design thinking. And I think everything you all just touched upon was how important collaboration, teamwork, open mind, and understanding that maybe what you threw out first time onto the board was not what's going to be the final product because that's unrealistic. And that's okay to understand your first iteration's not it. So um, thank you for your help on that. Uh, and so, Badgerland did want to say it is your turn to help. Uh, thank you to Midwest Prototyping for donating the Badger Shield Kit to the Girl Scouts and helping us be part of a movement to help our communities during the pandemic. We always talk about in Girl Scouts how when you join, you're part of a movement. And you had uh, touched upon um, that movement that really tries to grow um, young um young people to to you know be better to think further to challenge themselves in every way that they that they can find their passions and interests so um 
yeah, just thank you for uh, donating this and giving them an opportunity to be a literal part of our of the movement to help. Um, some fun things that I've people get. You'll see how excited people get when you make these for them. Um, they will be incredibly thankful, whether it's a assisted living home or a dentist's office or a clinic. Um, you know, people are looking for these things, and they will appreciate that you being a leader in your community and providing them. It's pretty awesome. What we've been seeing so far, people have, um, you know, they ask, where should we donate? And we always say, ask your community, you know, start looking around. And there's a lot of overlooked places as well, because we have people all the way from La Crosse to Madison to Beloit, Janesville. So we are a pretty wide council. And I've been hearing how small uh, community, local community access clinics are really grateful. I've been hearing about, um, yeah, senior citizen homes. And now with the talk about um, school districts, you know, opening, maybe not opening in, in that kind of um, situation that I think it was Cambridge that actually is, is all the troops in Cambridge came together to get a whole bunch so that they can make them for their staff and they awesome. feel prepared for in-person learning should in-person learning, you know, continue on as it is right now. So everyone on the call and for the recording, you can curbside pick up for free uh, the Badger Shield kits at our service centers in Madison, Janesville, and Platteville. Um, La Crosse actually um, sold out. They've all been picked up already by La Crosse troops who are ready to um, give them to their clinics and I think to their dentist's office and those um, yeah, smaller businesses that could really use them. Uh, we also have three how-to demos coming up. Please check our website at gsbadgerland.org or your Badgerland um, newsletter for further details. Um, they are going to be recorded. We just know that people would love that FAQ of, you know, what, what staplers do I need and, and how do I exactly put this together like a pizza? And it's, those are the kind of questions that we get. And so I'm really excited to do these quick 15 minute demos with people so they can ask their questions and it's a nice time to all get together virtually um, uh, in the management and, and do our part for the community. So with that, well, just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Huge thanks to um, Team Badgerfield. I know you guys are super busy in everything you're doing, um, both, you know, for the PPE, for the paper, P-A-P-R, sorry, all I could see was paper when I saw it, um, and all your other um, projects, and especially on a Saturday night when I think it's really nice outside, and I, you're really committed. Thank you so much. I'm super excited for the Girl Scouts to see your tips and tricks for moving forward with the Social Innovation Badge. Um, you know, as we move forward in a virtual world, a lot of videos from experts and hearing real talk and real um, situations is super helpful and inspiring. So thank you for your time. Thank you, um, everyone on the call. And um, I, look, I hope you all have a, a great weekend.